Welcome to St. Mark's United Methodist Church, the downtown church that feels like home, where everyone is a beloved child of God, precious and beautiful to behold. During this time of worship, it's our hope that you will feel the presence of God with you as the word is proclaimed through prayer, through music, through scripture, through a message right here on our St. Mark's United Methodist Church Facebook page, our YouTube channel, or the app. Today, we continue our sermon series, Faces of Our Faith, Bold and Untold Stories. I'm Reverend Cindy briggs Beyondi, and I'm glad to be with you in worship this morning. Will you join me in prayer? Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Open your hearts to God's loving mercy. Lord, come into our hearts this day. Having received God's mercy, bring that love to others. Lord, be with us as we reach out to others in compassion. Fill your spirits filled with the goodness of God. Lord, we thank you for the many blessings which you pour into our lives. Join me in the prayer for illumination. God of the ages, throughout history you have called people of every generation to you. You have illuminated hearts and minds with your goodness and grace. Today we ask that you open up our hearts and minds to receive you 
that we too might be transformed by your word, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey guys, it's Pastor Cindy, and today I just wanted to take some time to remind you about how much God loves you. You know, I have some some um, things here today to help us think about the question, can we measure God's love for us? Is it possible to measure God's love? And so the first thing I have, um, I have a measuring cup. Now you might use this when you're making cookies or cupcakes, you know, you, you, you use it to measure how much flour you need. Uh, you might measure the amount of sugar you need for the recipe. Uh, you might add uh, chocolate chips. In my world, this would not hold enough chocolate chips for my recipe. I would want many cups of chocolate chips. And so we use this to measure. But do you think that this can measure God's love for you? I don't know, because you hear, you know, in Psalm 23, we hear the words that God is our shepherd and he leads us beside still waters and he restores our soul. And it says, God prepares a table before us and he anoints our head with oil and our cup overflows. So maybe we can't measure God's love with this measuring cup. Well, let's try something else. I have here a tape measure, handy dandy tape measure. And we use this to, oh, you know, measure the length of the screen. How, how long is this? We, we try to see how high things are. Um, and this is a 25 foot tape measure. So that's pretty tall. I mean, that we can measure a a couple of stories. This can go way above the ceiling. But can this measure God's love for you? I don't know, because the Bible says that God's love reaches higher than the heavens. I don't think 25 feet can measure beyond the heavens. Hmm. Well, I have one more thing that maybe maybe we can use to measure God's love. I have my Fitbit, which is also my watch, and I use this to measure time and steps. Do you think we can use this to measure how long God will love us? I don't know. The Bible says that God's love for us goes on forever and ever. I don't think I have too much battery life left on this. So I don't think this will be able to measure how long God will love you and how long God will love me. You see, there's nothing that we have that can measure God's love because it is so much greater than we can understand. When the world fails us, when people fail us, when, when friends turn their backs or betray us, when we feel like our parents or our grandparents let us down, when we feel like we are not loved or we are unlovable, remember, there is nothing that can measure God's love for you because it is so much bigger than all of these things. I hope that you'll remember that today, that our cup overflows with God's love. It cannot be contained, that it reaches higher than the heavens and that it goes on forever and ever and ever. May you know today that you are a beloved child of God, precious and beautiful to behold. Will you pray with me? Oh God, we thank you for your love. Help us to rest in it, to claim it, and to know that it is true. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Amen.
On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people and, because he intended to leave the next day, kept on talking until midnight. There were many lamps in the upstairs room where we were meeting. Seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. When he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third floor and was picked up dead. Paul went down, threw himself on the young man, and put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said. He's alive. Then he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate. After talking until daylight, he left. The people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. I have been in church my whole life, and I was either there on Saturday nights or Sunday mornings growing up with my parents. And let me tell you, when I would go to church, I was bored out of my mind as a kid. I would take naps in the pew, or I would color sheets, or I would read a, a book that my mom had brought for me. Of course, they were always stories about Jesus and about um, the, the disciples, but I never wanted to pay attention in church. It was just so hard. They were talking about things that I didn't really understand and in ways that were really boring to me. There were, in fact, times that I dozed off during church. Now, I'm sure all of you wonderful people have, have never, ever done such a thing. You've never kind of felt your eyes closing or you look down at your watch and you hope the pastor will hurry up and, and wrap this thing up so you can get on with your day. Well, I love this story of Paul and Eutychus in Acts chapter 20 because I can really empathize with Eutychus. Here Paul is, and he's, he's in Troas, and he's there only for about a week, and it's his last day. And so he's trying to get in everything that he needs to say to this community of believers. And so it's evening, and Paul starts preaching, and uh, everyone's gathered around and he's, he's really getting into things and he just has so much to say that he keeps going on and on. And now it's 8 p.m. And then it was 9 p.m. And then maybe people started kind of looking at their watches, but Paul kept going still. On and on and on Paul preached until around midnight, there was a young man named Eutychus who was at the edge of the crowd. He was further back. He was on the, the outskirts of this gathering, and he was sitting up in a window. And now windows in that day and time were open. There weren't screens. There weren't glass doors. It was just They were either open or they were shuttered. And so he's sitting up in an open window on the ledge just because he's probably really tired and just wants to sit down and lean against something. And as Paul drones on and on and on and on even longer still, Eutychus feels his eyes start to get heavy. And he stops paying attention to the words because he just can't. Paul lost him a long time ago, and his eyes close, and he nods off to sleep. And yet he's in a dangerous position because he's a couple of stories up. And when Eutychus falls asleep, you know how when you fall asleep and you kind of start to, to have the, the head jerk and your muscle jerk? Eutychus falls asleep, and he falls out the window. He falls out the window to his death. Now, of course, in this story we hear and we see Paul um, you know, take on the authority of Christ and he is able to, to uh, raise Eutychus and it's like, he's not dead, he's asleep and Eutychus is, is fine and Paul goes right on back to preaching. Really, this is a story that's meant to highlight Paul and the ways in which he is following in the footsteps of Jesus, the ways in which he is empowered through the Holy Spirit by Jesus. 
But today, today I would like to look at this story as we, as we look at this face of our faith of Eutychus. I would like us to have a different reading of this story. What if today we read this story as a parable of warning to the church? Now, some of you may be familiar with, um, with the Barna Group, and they do all kinds of, of polls, of, of research about um, people's beliefs and how those beliefs connect to practice, how they live, how they vote, what they do. I mean, all kinds of things. And, and Barna uh, conducted some research a few years ago at this point asking why young people were leaving the church. I think we all know when, when, we, when we look around at our community that we want more children, we want more youth, we want more young adults in, in our community of faith. But across the board, there is a decreasing number of people my age and younger who are active in the life of the church. And so a few years back, Barna conducted some research to try to find out, well, why are young people leaving the church? For those who grew up active in it, why are they, why are they going? And they came, up, they, they came to several different conclusions, and I mean, I'll just briefly recap those for us. Um, one of those things is churches are overprotective or disengaged from the world. Um, the experience of Christianity feels shallow, like not relevant, disconnected. Churches are, are seen as antagonistic sometimes to, to science. Um, churches can be seen as judgmental, uh, especially around issues of human sexuality. Uh, there's wrestling with the exclusive nature of Christianity, and the church can feel really unfriendly to those who doubt, who have questions, who don't just want cookie-cutter answers. But today I don't really want to talk about those things, though I think it's important that we note them. But I want us to think about what would it mean, what would it mean to make sure that Eutychus, this representation of young people, is not pushed to the outskirts to sit on a window ledge where they might fall away. What does it mean and what does it look like to be a church faithful to its young people, to its children, to its youth? In 2019, when Barna conducted another study, they found that nearly two-thirds of 18 to 29-year-olds who grew up within the church and were active within the life of a church had withdrawn from church involvement. That's a really big number. But what they also found when they were doing this research that there were approximately 10 percent within that, um, that age range of 18 to 29 years old who were still active and engaged and present and thriving. And they called these people resilient disciples. And they asked questions. They wanted to find out, well, what was it about their faith or their experience in their community of faith that has made them stick around when two-thirds of their peers have withdrawn? And it came down to a number of different things. They, they looked at it in terms of, of five different categories. Um, when they talked to these, these young people who were still active in the church, they said things like, my experience of Jesus has been significant. My relationship with Jesus brings me deep joy and satisfaction. Jesus speaks to me in a way that is relevant to my life. Worship is a lifestyle, not just an event. They talked about cultural discernment, that the Bible teaching they receive in church is relevant to their lives. There's that word again, relevant. In their church, they say, in my church, I regularly re receive wisdom for how to live faithfully in the world around me. 
And in my church, I regularly receive wisdom for how the Bible applies to my life. Countercultural mission. They've said, I want others to see Jesus reflected through my words and actions. And they feel they have a responsibility to tell others about religious beliefs. And they're excited by the mission of the church in today's world. Vocational discernment is another area that they could articulate uh, their community of faith, helping them to engage and understand. They said, I want to use my unique talents and gifts to honor God, and their community helped them figure out a way to do that. Um, They said that their church does a good job of helping them understand how to live out their faith in their workplaces. And then finally, the fifth area that they could talk about was the area of meaningful relationships. The church is a place where I feel I belong. There is someone in my life who encourages me to grow spiritually. And when growing up, I had close personal friends who were adults from my church. These things, I think, reveal to us something about what it means to keep Eutychus from falling out of the window. We see in these, these things that um, these, this particular group of 18 to 29-year-olds were able to articulate, we see that they want to follow Jesus in a way that connects them to the world. They want to follow Jesus in a way that isn't just a Sunday morning thing, but is a life thing. It's not just something we we do out of duty, but it's something that is a way of life. They also see that God is at work in the world outside of the church perhaps sometimes even more than inside the church, and they want to be a part of that. They want to be Christian without separating themselves from the world. In other words, they don't want to live in a siloed off or disconnected way. So effectively, what does this research reveal to us? What does, it, what does it mean? How do we keep Eutychus from falling asleep and falling out of the window? The first thing I think it means is that we cannot, as a community of faith, silo off children and youth and young adult ministry and relegate it to, you know, this corner over here, and it's disconnected from worship and outreach ministry. No, we cannot silo children and youth and young adults off. We have to find a way to engage them in the whole life of the church. And so doing that in a way that makes sense and feels relevant to them might mean having to give up some of the things that we love and that make us feel comfortable. We cannot silo off children and youth and young adults. I think it also means we have to be willing to wrestle with the hard and the gray area questions about life and about faith. You know, I always have a joke with with clergy friends about, um, you know, when we ask a difficult question, we think of the Sunday school answer. Jesus, Jesus is the answer. If we just have this simple answer to all of these questions, then everything is made. No. To be faithful Christians and to engage children and youth and young adults, we can't be afraid or shrug off the gray area questions where we don't always have clear-cut answers, because life is full of gray area. And so our task as a community of faith is to say, you know, I may not always know the answer, but I know Jesus will teach us the way. 
I think it can also mean recognizing and equipping our children and our youth and our young adults to offer their gifts both in the church and in the world. And a lot of the time, that means having to think and work outside of the box. We can't just uh, square peg in a round hole everybody who's in the church. Some children have particular gifts that don't necessarily translate well into things that might already exist. Sometimes we have to be creative. And not only do we have to be creative about how we offer our own gifts within the church, but we have to think about how do we offer these gifts in the world around us and say, offering your gifts to the world on behalf of God is just as good and perhaps even more important than offering your gifts within the community of faith. I think it also means that we as a church cannot give in to the temptation to silo ourselves off from the rest of the world. It means we cannot relegate our faith and our faithfulness to a Sunday morning thing or maybe a Wednesday night thing. Faith, faith that will keep Eutychus from falling, has to be a faith that is fully engaging. It has to be a life-consuming faith. And guess what? If we ourselves are not willing to live out that faith, to have it be a 24-7 thing, then how in the world can we possibly expect our children and our youth and our young people to do the same? We can't expect children and youth to engage in the life of faith out of some concept of duty or loyalty to tradition. There has to be something else. You know, Eutychus was present in that crowd. He was there. Maybe, did his parents make him come? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe he was there but because he wanted to know. But then Paul just kept droning on and on, and he started to kind of go cross-eyed because he wasn't sure what any of this meant for him. And so he just nodded off. We might be able to make our children come to church and sit with us, and, and we should certainly do that. But we, if we expect them to get faith by osmosis just from sitting in the building, then we are not looking for Eutychus. You know, one of the things that I, I think about Eutychus is he was at the edge of the room. He was behind others. And so while everybody was focusing on Paul, nobody was paying attention to Eutychus. Nobody was there to, to nudge him, to wake him up, to keep him from falling asleep and falling out of that window. What would have happened if Eutychus had been brought in from the, the outskirts of the gathered community into the very center? Might things have been different for him? Each week we've been asking, what does faithfulness look like as we, as we hear these stories of our faith, the faces of our faith? And today I think this story of Eutychus asks us to consider how are we living faithfully and demonstrating faithfulness to the children and youth who call this place home. What can we learn from this story as we read it as a parable of warning, a parable of challenge? Are we looking? Are we prepared to catch Eutychus when he falls? And even more, I would say, are we prepared to bring Eutychus into the very center, 
into the very heart of who we are so that he might be embraced and surrounded by a community that can teach him and show him that the gospel of Jesus Christ is a relevant way of life for all of us. What does it mean to be faithful? May we hear this challenge in this story of Eutychus today. And may we hear God's voice and have God's discernment that we might help Eutychus experience the wholeness and the goodness of new life in Jesus Christ. Amen. Three, two, one.
Lord of hope and healing, you have heard the cries of our hearts. You know that we do want to serve you, and yet when things get tough, we buckle and cave in. We lack the courage and strength to work for you. You have reminded us that you will be continually with us, and we need to place our trust in that fact. Your love will sustain and heal us. Your mercy and grace will give us courage and strength, joy and peace. As we kind of come before you this day, offering our prayers for those near and dear to us, let us remember that you constantly lift and carry us in your love. Bring us to the knowledge of your mercy and powerful love that will never leave us. Prepare us for ministry in areas of need and desolation. For these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive those who trespass us, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord Christ be always with you. Today, may you find a way to offer a sign of peace to a child, a youth, a young person in your family, in this faith community, to let them know that you love them, to remind them that God is with them, and that the peace of Christ is with us all. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.